Good morning. And those of you here, welcome back to Worship at Ascension. Those of you joining us line, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is, for those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Robin Zaratsky. I am a member at our sister church in Gethsemane, Raleigh. Happy to be here leading worship with you, giving Pastor Doug a Sunday off, uh, as I know pastors definitely need. Uh, we're going to continue our stand sermon series today. We're going to look at standing by faith and, and really look at what it means to have faith in something. And, of course, in particular, the faith we have in our God and in Jesus. Uh, our worship service uh, will begin then with our opening song, God is for us. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. Now may God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. We pray. 
Almighty God and Savior, you have set the final day and hour when we shall be delivered from this world of sin and death. Keep us ever watchful for the coming of your Son, that we may sit with him and all your holy ones at the marriage feast in heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. first lesson for today is taken from or is Psalm 13 uh, which will also serve as the basis for our message this morning. The psalm reads, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I experience worries in my soul and sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy tower over me? Look at me. Answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes so I do not sleep in death. So my enemy does not say, I have overcome him. So my foes do not rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your mercy. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has accomplished his purpose for me. This is the word of our Lord. Let's confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our second lesson for today is taken from the letter to the Galatians where we read in chapter 3. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those that have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with our song of praise, Grace.
Our gospel for today comes from the book of St. John, where we read in chapter 5. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. and My judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself but him who sent me. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We'll continue with our sermon song, Not Unto Us. My dear brothers and sisters, what do you do, how do you react when someone lets you down? Last weekend I moved. My wife and I rented a truck. We asked some friends to lend us a hand and we did our best to have everything ready for moving day. I mean, they're doing us the favor we should be ready. 
Now, because we were moving out of a, a small place and we didn't really have a ton of stuff, I didn't ask a lot of people for help. Just enough that we could, we could get the job done in a timely manner and not be stepping on each other's toes as we came and went through the door. But last Saturday when the time came to start hauling, there was a, a pair of people, a friend of mine and his, his wife, who didn't show up right away. And as time went on, they still weren't there, and we hadn't heard anything from them. And with the small crew we had planned on being down by two, well, the, the load started to seem a little heavier, a little more frequent, and the work was a little more grueling than maybe it should have been. So there's the question, how do I react to this? As I'm, I'm struggling down a flight of stairs with a, a couch when we should have been done 20 minutes ago, what's going through my mind? Now, obviously, the natural reaction is anger, right? How dare this person blow me off? We were, we were counting on you. You, you told me multiple times you'd be here. I gave you directions. You said you knew how to get here. I shouldn't have to be putting up with this. Okay, that's one way. Or maybe I trust my friend. I know him pretty well. And granted, we are all sinful. We are all capable of some very selfish acts it would be pretty far out of character for this person to just blow me off. And so even though I'm, I'm sweaty and miserable, the, the reasonable, the proper response is to trust that something happened. Something happened to stop him from being there, something he couldn't control. I, I shouldn't be angry best I should be praying that he's okay. And in the end, we got everything moved. And when I did finally hear from my friend, he had a very, very good reason for not being there. The details aren't important. That's not the point. The point is about trust. Or to put it another way, like we have in our God, faith. We're going to talk about faith in God this morning, what it means to have that faith, especially in the face of evidence that says otherwise, and how we can really stand by that faith, stand in that faith no matter what. But let's start off by talking about that evidence to the contrary, that evidence that says our faith in God is misplaced. It seemed to me that day that my friend forgot or didn't care. And as the rest of us labored without him, it, it made it easier to think nasty thoughts about him because of the evidence. So what happens when God seems to let you down that way? Now, okay, you're sitting here in church talking about God. You say, I know better. God doesn't forget. That doesn't stop the feelings in the midst of the bad stuff, does it? That doesn't stop the question from cropping up when we're suffering, does it? And let's not pretend that we are, are too good to feel that way or that it would somehow be shameful to admit this, this has happened to us because our reading for today is a psalm from King David. David, who was arguably the greatest king of Israel and, and one of the greatest examples of faith, in the Lord, in the Old Testament, David was a human being. David was sinful, and David had his times of weakness. Our psalm for today, Psalm 13, is just one example of him wrestling with that sinful nature, struggling with, with feeling like he'd been forgotten and abandoned by God. So I'm going to read again the start of that psalm and, and see if these words that, that he has there resonate with you. And he says, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? 
How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I experience worries in my soul, sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy tower over me? Look at me. Answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes so I do not sleep in death. So my enemy does not say, I have overcome him. So my foes do not rejoice when I fall. I read that, and it almost makes me want to cry. Big manly tears, don't get me wrong. All right? But still, it's heartbreaking to hear someone else suffer like that, and perhaps even more so because I know exactly what that feels like. There's so much trouble in our world and in our own lives, but we get through it. We get through it because we know we have God to lean on and that he is always there to help us. So how do we handle it when it starts to seem like he's not there helping us anymore? If we start to to question, we start to doubt or just plain think he's not helping. Again, sitting here, ridiculous, you might think. But falling into that is easier than you might think. King David wrestled with it. Let's, let's take a look at each of his laments in turn and, and ask yourself if you've ever felt that way. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? You know, when we, we suffer under a difficulty, when we pray to God for help and, and nothing changes, when days turn into weeks and, and maybe those weeks turn into months and years, and it's still the same? How long can we endure that same trouble before we we start sending off cries like this? How long, oh Lord? Lord, are you you listening? Are you there? Why are you hiding? Am I I at the bottom of a to-do list that you're going to get to eventually, or have you just forgotten me entirely? How long must I experience worries in my soul? Sorrow in my heart every day. When those problems drag on and we don't get help, there's, there's no attention being paid. How many days then do you spend wrapped up in worries about it? And how many sleepless nights does that bring? I mean, if God would just help, if God would just acknowledge you, then, then maybe you could have some peace knowing this is going to be handled But when it seems so painfully obvious that you're on your own, you end up in that state where nothing gets done because all your time and energy is consumed by worry and sorrow over nothing getting done. How long will my enemy tower over me? Maybe this struggle is caused by more than just bad circumstance. Maybe there's literally people acting against you. Maybe you have a particular thorn or two in your side that you have to deal with regularly. Maybe it's just the random indifference maybe, or, or spite of people that you meet day to day. It's easy to feel like you're the one losing against them, like you're always the one who has to bend and give in and give up, and it, it shouldn't have to be that way. I mean, if God were here, if God were on my side, I shouldn't be losing to just people. Look at me. Answer me, O Lord my God, give light to my eyes. And here's here's the, the, the depth of the lament. The questions pile up. The evidence piles up. We wonder why God doesn't help. He doesn't act where he is at all. And all we want is just, just an answer from him. Even if you're not going to fix it, God, at least talk to me. As Christians, we, we understand and we accept that this life needs to have trouble in it. Right? God did not say this was going to be perfectly easy, but, but when we're in the middle of the trouble, is it, is it too much to ask him to at least explain it a little? To, to give light to our eyes? Show us, why is this going on, okay? It, it would be so much easier to bear God if I just could see the purpose behind it, but it just feels so needless. It seems like we get radio silence. 
it comes to that point where maybe, maybe we accept the suffering, but all we really want to know is why. So I do not sleep in death. So my enemy does not say I have overcome him. So my foes do not rejoice when I fall. Maybe one last point here that that sort of drives home this idea that God must not be paying attention. Because what sort of message is it sending to the world around us when his people, God's people, are the ones suffering the most, getting beaten down the most, and succeeding the least? If the enemies of God's people literally kill them and God does not retaliate, if our lives are our struggle after struggle against people who look down on us for being Christian, what does that say? They, they sit and they laugh and they rejoice because they win and, and we lose and, and we're not even clever enough to see how wrong we are. Because you know what? If God were really here, they wouldn't be able to get away with half of what they do to us, right? You know what, brothers and sisters? It's, it's compelling evidence. When you look to see, is God here? Has he maybe forgotten you? It makes a good argument. But you can't just look at half the evidence. Consider both sides. And take a look here at how our psalm ends. David, after all of these laments, did not stop at that point. After listing all of these reasons that he has to despair, he finishes the psalm like this. But I trust in your mercy. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has accomplished his purpose for me. How? After everything he just listed off, how could David make such bold claims as this? Well, we're going to talk about that in a lot of detail here, but it really comes down to one word at the end of the first line, mercy. In the original language, the word here is chesed. It's a special word that really captures what God's love is all about. My favorite way to bring that into English is unfailing love. There's a couple of things that make this love of God's unique. Because God's love is unlike most love that you know. I mean, we love, ask yourself, how do we love, right? We love as a reaction, regardless of the kind of love you're talking about, okay? whether it's a family member or a friend or it's romantic or just a good cheeseburger, something appeals to us and we love as a reaction. But not God. God's love has its origin in, its, in himself. He loves because he chooses to. It has nothing to do with us, has nothing to do with how we act. And even more than that, he loves because it is a defining quality of who he is. So God's love is not something that changes by circumstance. It's not affected by by what he saw on Facebook or on the news that morning or because he ate something that disagreed with him. It's not changeable like our emotions are. He cannot stop loving you because it literally defines who he is. So God's love for you is unfailing. It is an objective fact. And most importantly, God's love for you has a singular driving purpose. It is to do what is best for you at all times. That is all God does with his love and with all the power and all the authority he has behind it. He only ever uses it to do what is best for you. All of that is wrapped up in that word, chesed. That alone is enough to have faith in. That alone is evidence enough to dispel the doubts 
that God has forgotten us. We can, we can trust in that mercy, in that unfailing love. But the great thing about God, he doesn't stop there. He gives us proof, so much evidence that he loves you, that he does not forget, that he does not abandon. And so I want to take time this morning to consider the trail of evidence that God has left for you about his love. We're going to be brief. From the moment the first people, Adam and Eve, sinned, he was there to help. They broke his law. They condemned themselves and everyone after them to eternal separation from God. And yet God came immediately and promised a savior. He promised someone who would undo that devil's work and bring back peace between God and his people. And from then on, well, we don't possibly have time to get into every example, but from then on, the Old Testament of the Bible is, is pretty much just account after account of God's faithful love to his people, taking care of them both in the moment and more importantly, guiding history to reach that point when we were ready for that Savior to arrive. Now, the people, the people constantly turned away. They constantly rejected God, constantly complained, and they constantly forgot him. But all the evidence is there. He never forgot them. He never abandoned them. He always did what was best for them. And of course, we reach the culmination of God's unfailing love through history when we get to Jesus. When God became one of us so he could go in our place. For all the times that we have turned from God, all the times we've doubted his love or failed to trust him, Jesus did it perfectly. And then he sacrificed his perfect life so that our wrongs could be taken away from us. He suffered our punishment so we could be set free. He did that. God. God who does not need us. God who we only ever antagonize. God gave up everything and died so we could be spared the punishment we earned ourselves. And to prove it was true, he rose from the dead and he proclaimed us forgiven in him. Jesus, that whole act of, of death and resurrection, that is the full expression of Hesed, his unfailing love. Jesus is the best evidence that God has not forgotten you. Jesus is what we put our faith in. And yet, even though that's the best and that would be enough, God still doesn't stop there. In the history that followed Jesus, God watched over his people, guided his believers to spread the good news about Jesus through the world. He took care of those who loved him, and he reached out through them to get to as many more as they could. And through their effort and through God's guidance, you, you have been taught about Jesus. You have been brought to faith in him. And you have the truth. You have a trust that lets you escape this world and go on to paradise. God did that for you. He's never forgotten you. He's always thinking about getting you home to be with him. That's what we have faith in. That's what we trust in. And you know what? I want to scale it back for just a minute. Because yes, God absolutely has saved you through Jesus. And yes, that is all we truly need. It is the best demonstration of his love. But even back at our daily problems, he's still there. 
he has not forgotten you even in the minutia of your life. And he has not left you alone. And there's more evidence to trust him. You have it. Okay, I, I can't tell you what this one is. Look back over your own life. Take a minute. Look back and see all the times that God has guided you, guarded you, directed you, and cared for you. Maybe it was that accident you narrowly avoided. Maybe it was a foolish decision or, for me, about a dozen that should have derailed your life. But it didn't. God corrected it. Maybe it's all the times God just let all the right pieces fall into the right place at exactly the right time to bless you better than you thought possible. If you look back, you'll see it. It's evidence that God has been there all along. With that in mind, let's circle back to our original problem. When we're there in the midst of trouble and, and it doesn't seem like God is helping. Because all the stuff I just said is absolutely true and it's very uplifting, but it doesn't actually make that problem out there go away, right? It's not just gone because we talked about this. So what do we do? The solution is to stand by faith. You see, God is great at showing us his work throughout history, but he doesn't tell us everything. And that's when we fall back on faith. Faith is what we hold on to when we don't know exactly what God is up to. <coughs> to kind of state it the opposite way, if we always knew what God was thinking and everything he was up to and exactly how he was going to fix and change every problem in our lives, if we were always looking over his shoulder, seeing everything he did and why he did it, having confidence in that wouldn't really be trust, would it? Trust is what we lean on when we don't know all the facts behind everything. The faith we stand in, the faith that God has given us, we know enough to stand by that faith when we can't see the rest. And so that faith, that trust, that lets us say to God, I'm suffering, but I know you're here. I know you love me. I know you died to save me. And I know you are only working the best way to get me home. And so as much as this hurts, I believe you when you say this is what is best for me, even if I can't understand, even if I can't see how that is. Faith does not need to understand everything God does. It just knows God loves me. That's enough. And in the end, when he does deliver us, we will look back. And we will see that God always had it under control. So brothers and sisters, when we struggle to stay standing by faith, return to God. Specifically, go back to his word and consider his promises. For example, promises like this one. I will never forget you. Doesn't get much more on the nose than that, does it? That's just a sample. You will find that and so many more in his word. And on top of that, you will find the proof that he carries out his promises. Beyond that, that greatest promise and fulfillment in Jesus, you will see all those other times God said he would act. and Never once does he fail. And as if that were not great enough, God's word has a special promise associated with it. God promises his power in his word. He promises to work through that word to build up your trust in him. It's not even up to you. Being in his word, studying what he has given us, he will do the work of building up your faith in him. 
And in the fullness of that trust, in the fullness of that faith, we can endure the difficulties. Not that we won't occasionally lament, not that we won't have days when it feels like more than we can bear, but standing by faith, we can repeat confidently with David, I trust in your mercy. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has accomplished his purpose for me. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Just like to take a moment to uh, remind everyone, this is usually when we would offer our thanks to God in, in terms of monetary gifts by collecting an offering. Obviously, we're not going to be passing a plate now, but take a moment. Uh, think about how God has blessed you and how you want to respond to that doesn't necessarily need to be a, a monetary gift, but how you want to show your thanks for what God has done for you. Additionally, we'd love to have you fill out a connection card, especially if you're a first-time visitor or first-time watching online. Uh, please take a moment to go to that website and uh, fill it in there for us. Otherwise, we'll continue with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you today most especially for the certainty you provide us. You do not change. Your promises are fact. You are not subject to our failings. You love us with an infallible love. Forgive us for poor trust, Lord. Forgive us for feeling abandoned because we do not see or understand how you are working. Forgive us for doubting your presence and guidance that you promised during dark and difficult times. Lord, we believe you, but help us overcome our unbelief. Wash away our sins daily in Jesus and bring us closer to you and your word so that our faith and trust in you can grow. Build up that trust to know you are always with us, you are always caring for us, and that you are guiding us on the necessary path home to be with you and free of trouble forever. Help us daily to stand on the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection for us and use your word and sacraments to build up the faith you have given us in that truth. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We close with our final song, Faith. <laughs>
once again, good morning to you all. It is, it is always a joy, and it's always a privilege to be able to share God's word with you. So thank you for inviting me out. Uh, happy to do this. I wasn't told to announce anything in particular. Is there anything we need to announce before the day's out? Okay. Yeah, well, it's, it's all up there. Just keep watching. You'll, you'll get it. So, Again, thank you for coming out today, and have a blessed week in the Lord. Thank you.